I wanted to introduce our kind of keynote speaker for this evening, uh, Dale Strickler. Uh, Dale uh, is a full-time agronomist for Green Cover Seed, and uh, he also farms and ranches uh, on the side. Seems like it might be an addiction. He's been doing it for 30 years. Um, so uh, he's located in Southeast Kansas, um, and he's been uh, using cover crops for over 30 years. And so he's here to talk about how to fit cover crops into a semi-arid environment and talking about um, cover crops and the benefits of them in light of moisture concerns. I mean, we know we're in a drought, we, uh, we've seen the snowpack and I think people are a little bit concerned. So uh, Dale's here to talk us off the cliff. And so with that, um, thank you, Dale, for coming. Thank you. So what is the ideal soil? I mean, what makes a better soil better? I mean, obviously the ideal soil will do these things. It will supply water, of course, mineral nutrients, and something very few people think about, but is extremely important, and that's oxygen to the same root at the same time. And, and that is an extremely difficult job. And, and we'll talk about why that's so difficult. I mean, how, how can a soil do this? Because the difficulty lies in is that uh, a soil will be about half solid matter, organic matter, silt and clay. The other half is pore space, or it should be half pore space, but it seldom is because of compaction. And that's one of our limiting factors is soil compaction. The other problem is, is that the more, you know, you'd like more water in your soil, you also want more air in your soil, but the more air you get, the less room there is for water. The more water you get, the less room there is for air. So you always have to, you're trying to strike a balance between these two, and it's very difficult to walk a tightrope. And I, I noticed when you were talking about the soil types that a lot of people had sandy soil. Well, sandy soil is very well aerated typically, but it is very low in water holding capacity. And then clay soils, on the other hand, very high in water holding capacity, but very poorly aerated. It's very hard for rainfall to enter a clay soil, and it's very hard for oxygen to enter a clay soil. So what you want is Goldilocks soil. You'd like something in between, but even more importantly than having a balance of sand, silt, and clay, is having all those particles glued together to form this chocolate cake-like structure, this, this well-aggregated structure. And the reason that's so important is because this gives you the best of sand and the best of clay because it has these large macro pores in it, which act like the superhighways to allow air and water to move into the soil. You've got these mesopores and micro pores that allow water to be held. So roots can be growing through these. They can obtain water from the mesopores and micropores and oxygen from the macropores. And this allows, the, the macropores also allow the soil to absorb rainfall, which is critically important in a, in a dry land and well in any environment, it's, it's critically important. So what's the problem here? Why don't our soils have this? Well, one of the biggest limiting factors is what we've done in the past and that's with tillage. Tillage creates this, uh, as you're looking at this shovel full of soil here, uh, here where I'm moving my cursor is the topsoil and, and here this way is the subsoil and this is the plow pan. As that plow lifted up, it had to press down. Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so you smashed those round aggregates into flat plates and now there is no pore space. So water has a hard time getting in and air has a hard time getting in. And roots have to have at least 10% oxygen in order to grow. So without these, these big pore spaces, you really are restricting your root zone. And when your root zone is restricted, your uptake of water and nutrients is gonna be restricted. So, so how do we fix this? How do we get rid of this? Well, first of all, we need to get some macropores in that soil. What makes macropores? What made this little hole right here 
looks like the drill bit made that. But actually the, the key to making this is you can see the fuzzy red animals in the back. This hole was made by a dung beetle. This is why we talk about integrating livestock grazing to make soil better. Because with livestock grazing, you get manure and with manure, you get dung beetles and they will poke those holes and bury manure. Another soil animal that can make those macropores are earthworms. And earthworms is something that we can, we can feed. We can change the earthworm diet. And in most dryland agriculture, we focus on grass crops because they tend to be more drought tolerant. We'll have corn, sorghum, wheat, barley. Well, guess what? None of those grass crops are very good at nourishing earthworms. Earthworms need legumes and brassicas in their diet. You can see here when you feed them red clover or alfalfa, they grow in weight. If you feed them brassicas, they really grow in weight. But if you just feed them grass crops, they don't because grass residue doesn't have enough protein to nourish an earthworm. So one of the roles of cover crops is that they're killed in a vegetative high protein state that feeds earthworms. You can see here, this some some Kansas State research data. This was wheat sort rotation to grass crops, very low protein residue on both. When you put the high protein cover crop in there, look what happens to your worm numbers. This was after six years, basically seven times the earthworm numbers where you had that sun hemp cover crop. So yes, there are things you can do with these cover crops to really increase your soil porosity. And of course, another means of increasing those macropores with the cover crops is the roots themselves. And this uh, photo you're looking at here is actually two photos. The one on the left, this was taken with an underground camera uh, inserted in a plexiglass tube. And this is on the 3rd of May, a cover crop, uh, a canola root that was part of a cover crop mixture. And it was spray killed out, killed with no tillage, and that's critical. And then this next picture over here is a soybean root on the 8th of August. And you notice that soybean root used that canola root channel as a pilot hole went right down the same path of leaf, least resistance there and then branched out from there. And that enables that soybean root to root deeper than it would otherwise. And so cover crops can be used to deepen that root zone. We'll talk more about that later. And some cover crops are obviously better at making big holes like this big radish. And, and if you wanna know how big this radish actually is, this guy, standing here is six foot seven. So that's a, a big guy and a big radish. There's an even bigger radish. But radishes, and, and we found this out the hard way. You know, we're, we're constantly having to reinvent the wheel in this cover crop thing uh, because we forgot what our ancestors knew long ago. We thought we were smart enough to get by without cover crops because we had synthetic fertilizer. We had, you know, we didn't need to grow cover crops anymore. How wrong we were. Um, here is, we learned that you need diversity. Um, those radishes alone provide no soil cover. They, they provide the big holes in the ground, but then they, they winter kill, they rot away, there's no residue. So you got big holes in the ground, but without a mulch, you lose too much water to evaporation. So having diversity out there really helps. And this is one of those radish holes but there was a companion crop of annual ryegrass that's holding that hole open, keeping it from collapsing so it can persist longer. So that's how you create macropores. But what about those mesopores? Those mesopores that are responsible for holding water once it's in the soil. That's created through a process of aggregation. And what creates aggregates? Well, the biggest former of aggregates, the most powerful one, is mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, this little V-shape is a root tip and all these little threads coming out of that are mycorrhizal fungi hyphae. They can, uh, they play a big role in drought tolerance. They reach out up to 18 inches past the root zone. 
bring water and nutrients back to the plant, but everywhere they go, they secrete a little lubricant called glomalin. And that glomalin is the most powerful soil aggregating agent known. And the problem is, is that because we have in arid areas, particularly, we have had a practice called fallow. And during fallow, these mycorrhizal fungi that need a host plant in order to survive, starve out. This was nature's drought tolerance. This is what enabled plants to grow under limited moisture. And the, once we started farming here and started incorporating fallow into the system, this beneficial fungus went away. And when it went away, we lost a lot of our natural drought tolerance. Fallow helped us temporarily, but it hurt us long-term. And you can see here, this plant on the right was not inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. This one to the left was. And you just notice a big difference between these two oat plants. Uh, the soil just melted away here, no structure. Whereas on the inoculated plant, all that root ball was held together. And that mycorrhizal fungi needs one thing to live. It's very tough, but it has to have root exudates in order to survive. That's how it survives. It's with those roots. And those root exudates are so incredibly important. This was a summary of 17 different research trials and they compare it, they use radioactive labeled materials, determine how much of each type of plant material ended up as soil organic matter. The most efficient by far was root exudates. Root exudates are how you build soil organic matter. And that's why cover cropping is so important because organic matter, you know, it's responsible for the structure, it's responsible for water holding capacity, nutrient holding capacity, it's important for so many things in the soil. And our practice of fallow and our practice of tillage got rid of all that. And so the only way to build it back is to grow more plant material. And every time I'd come to an arid area, people tell me that, oh, that won't work around here. And <laughs> believe me, it's not just Eastern Colorado where I hear that. I was at a farm over the weekend, did a little consulting visit, and they said, oh, that won't work around here. I said, well, why not? I said, you don't understand. It just gets really dry around here. I said, well, what's your annual rainfall? They said, it's only 50 inches. Mm -hmm. so I hear that everywhere, folks, but everywhere they're wrong, but wrong for different reasons. And, and, and so um, one of the presentations I would really like to give was, was is the basically all about the cover crops don't belong here because it's too dry thing, but it's really very long, complicated talk. So um, the secret to farming successfully, there's only one person I know, only one farmer I know that gets all the rain he needs when he needs it. And that guy's name is Hugh Guys. And I don't know where he farms, but everywhere I go, people tell me we just don't get as much rain as you guys. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm glad somebody's laughing at that thank you very much oh, gosh. <laughs> problem with the problem with zoom calls you don't get the audience feedback so let's take a look at this moisture thing okay um so let's say you start out with 15 inches of annual rainfall and uh three of inches of that occur in the month of june which is about your average so if you harvest wheat on July 1st and you plant sorghum following June 1st, let's just say you're broad acre cropping and, and, uh, and a, a wheat sorghum fallow rotation, during that fallow period, you'll receive 12 inches of moisture on the average. And a three foot soil profile on a silt loam will hold about six inches. So at planting time the next year, this is what your field should look like because there should be six inches of moisture sitting on top of the ground, right? Because you stored it all, or do you? How many of you are planting in these conditions every year? You don't, do you? What happened to all that six inches that's supposed to be there that you stored? Well, it ran off or evaporated. So fallow, 
Fallow is an incredibly silly system to me because during that 10 or 11 month fallow period, research shows that you're only going to store about 25% of the moisture that occurs during that period. What's your limiting factor here? Moisture. And you've got locked yourself into a system where you waste 75% of it. You get two things for free in farming, sunlight and rainfall. And fallow is a system that wastes 75% of the rainfall during that period and waste 100% of the sunlight. Why do you do it? And it's because we're foolishly chasing a grain crop in an area that's really not well suited to producing grain. And, and that's what my hour and a half talk is all about. So uh, that's just a teaser, I guess. So all that water produced during that fallow period produced nothing of value. What if you could use that rainfall and use it to produce a more drought tolerant field in the future. And that's how cover crops work. So what do cover crops do that make the field more drought tolerant going forward? Now, I will tell you, and those of you that have done this, and I can tell some of you this has happened to, the very first cover crop you grow, cover crops do use moisture. Make no mistake about that. They use moisture. At the termination of a cover crop, you're probably gonna be about an inch and a half less moisture than no-till stubble without a cover crop. But from that point on, the mulch created by that cover crop will increase your infiltration rate. You can see this is some, some Kansas data. No-till wheat stubble is the, the black dots. Look at this, over a three hour time period, 180 minutes, triple the infiltration rate. This no-till wheat stubble held two inches in three hours with the cover crop held six inches in three hours. That's pretty amazing. Those of you that have seen the NRCS rainfall simulator have seen this demo. They just have different treatments and the ones to keep your eye on, conventional tillage. When I was a kid, grandpa told me we had to till that soil because that's it. we have to let the rain in. We have to have that soil loosened up so rain will soak in. And he went to his grave cussing no-till, calling it lazy man farming. And uh, so what happens when you put a two inch rainfall on this jar and, and this treatment? Keep an eye on what happens. Look at this, no runoff, no soil lost. And look at all the wasted water and all the wasted soil here. No-till cover cropping promotes infiltration reduces runoff and because it reduces runoff, reduces erosion. But the most amazing thing about that NRCS demo is when they flip those pans over, look at this tilled one. These pans are two inches deep and a two inch rain did not penetrate two inches into the soil. How long is it gonna be before this one's thirsty again? All that water's right up on the surface where it's gonna readily evaporate. Having that mulch from that cover crop not only promotes infiltration, also reduces evaporation. Some research at K-State at Garden City, a mulch reduced evaporation during the growth of a corn crop by three inches. According to the USDA at Akron in Eastern Colorado, that's worth about 11 bushels per inch or an extra 33 bushels of corn. And on an annual basis, that's five extra inches of moisture. If the mulch, covers more than 75% of the soil surface. Why does that happen? Well, it keeps the temperature low. For one thing, look at this. Now this is degrees Celsius, but 35 is about 96, 97 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Without cover, 55, that's 140. How, high do you, how hot do you try to get the inside of a turkey on Thanksgiving? 140. Why? To kill microbes. That's good inside a turkey you're about to eat, but that's bad inside your soil. 99.9% .9 of those microbes are doing something good for you. Illustrate how important mulch is. Well, take a look at this. This is uh, double crop soybeans planted after wheat harvest in the year 2012. Soybeans died. Now, why would beans die in 2012? Didn't rain, right? Well, 
here's another double crop bean field planted after wheat harvest. Nice and healthy. This must be Hugh Guy's farm. No, actually, these are the same field. The difference is where the red arrow is, you can see the line right here. The straw was bringing $60 a ton, so this farmer thought he would bail up the straw. Right here's where his swather broke down. He didn't want to wait to get this little strip bailed up, so he just left the rest of it and no-tilled into it. 30 bushel different, zero versus 30 on those soybeans. And soybeans were about $13 a bushel that year. It's almost $400 an acre difference in revenue between this and this. I don't think the $60 worth of straw paid for the difference in the yield. The other thing cover crops can do is deepen your root zone. Now what I've got here, there are two different soil cores here. The one in the wooden tray, this is from native grassland. This one is right across the fence line. These were five feet apart. Now, what I'm gonna show you here is this is the bottom core three feet down in the native grassland, red. And this is in the tilled soil, gray. Iron compounds in the soil turn red when exposed to oxygen. You can also see the root fragments there. Over here on the tilled ground, you know, when I was taught that you till soil to aerate it, well, that works until the next drain, then it seals shut and you break down aggregation and then you stop the flow of air. So you can see right here, tilled soil has less oxygen than tilled soil. So what do cover crops do? Look at this, conventional tillage here, no cover crops. The root zone, these are adjacent soil pits, four inches deep and stop. Over here, six years cover crop and no-till, Look at these roots, 31 inches and going. Think that's going to help you out in a drier year? Let's find out. At this site, now it's in Illinois, you think, well, we don't have anything in common with Illinois. Well, actually that year you did because they only had three inches of rain from planting to harvest. How'd these different treatments turn out? Okay, conventional till, first year no-till, Long-term no-till. Now, what about where you had the cover crop sucking up all the water over the winter? How's that compare to your no-till or, or your conventional tillage? How do you raise 120 bushel corn on three inches of water? You don't. What happened was those big deep roots were tapping into moisture that had never been used the previous year. So just deepen that profile. Now, the other way, to extract moisture, I talked about the mycorrhizal fungi, these white threads. This enables you to access more soil volume. And you can see here, mycorrhizal inoculated corn, non-inoculated. But the most important thing those cover crops do is build organic matter. Now this is uh, Gove, Kansas. This would be around the Colby area. Dead corn. Why didn't, why is this corn dead? Didn't rain. But this is the same farmer, same hybrid of corn, planted same day, right across the road. Same rainfall. How come this corn's live and the other corn's dead? Well, it has to do with what happened in the 20 years previous. This field just came out of CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. Perennial grasses. What will perennial grassland build over time in your soil? organic matter. And the more organic matter you have, this is organic carbon, the more organic carbon you give in your soil, the higher your yields go. Number one predictor of crop yield is your level of soil organic matter. And as the organic matter goes up in your soil, as you go from 1% to 5%, your water holding capacity basically doubles. And if you can go from 1% to 4% organic matter, that's basically like putting one of these 50,000 gallon water tanks on every acre you farm. But you can do other things with cover crops too. So this no-till soybeans growing in a cover crop mulch of rye. What do you not see out here? You don't see weeds. 
Why don't you see weeds? Well, that rye sucked up, and I'll show you here. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. Why are there weeds over here and not over here? This rye sucked up all the leftover nitrogen in the soil. Soybeans are a legume. They make their own. They don't care. They're like the honey badger. They don't care. But over here, all that leftover nitrogen is available to grow weeds. So not only do you have a mulch to increase rainfall infiltration, that same mulch helps control your weeds. One way it controls weeds is by sucking up the nitrogen. You say, well, that works great, but um, I'm not planting soybeans. I'm planting corn or I'm planting tomatoes or I'm planting potatoes or onions. So I don't want to tie up my nitrogen because tying up nitrogen, you can see here where the red arrow is. <laughs> Look where you tied up the nitrogen ahead of this corn crop with that ryegrass cover crop. That's not good. But another way that weeds can, this is a, a farmer roller crimping down a crop of hairy vetch, a legume. And you say, well, legumes increase nitrogen. Doesn't that increase your weeds? What about this guy? This is no-till organic. This guy applied no herbicide, no tillage, roller crimped hairy vetch. That's it. How's this controlling weeds? Well, basically, most of your weeds, very small seeded, only have a limited amount of energy. Pig weeds can only go about three quarters of an inch before they run out of sunlight or before they run out of energy. If they haven't hit sunlight by then, they're dead. So having a good thick mulch can suppress weeds as well. Corn, big seed, plenty of energy reserves. Also, the nitrogen here is in the form of protein, not nitrate, not ammonium. And most weeds need nitrogen in the nitrate form. Another thing you can do with cover crops, and I know this is a big problem over a lot of areas of Colorado, is iron deficiency chlorosis, iron deficiency. Can cover crops help this? Yes, they can. This, uh, you can see here, soybeans, no cover crop, four bushel to the acre. Over here where they used a no cover crop, 40 bushels an acre. 36 bushel difference. How's this work? Well, basically plants have to remain electrically neutral and the nutrients they take up are either positive or negative charged. So when a plant takes up a negative charge, in this case nitrate, uh, it gives off bicarbonate, which is also negative charged out of the root. That's how they remain neutral. And bicarbonate makes iron in the soil less available. But if you use a cover crop to suck all that nitrogen up, force those soybeans to fix nitrogen like they're supposed to, because they're a legume, that nitrogen is coming in the form of ammonium. And so to counterbalance that, they use hydrogen ions, which acidify that little zone right around the, the soil. You talked about how high pH reduces your soil health score. This can help fix that at least in a little zone around that plant. Now, some sample cover crops. Now, um, again, I'm talking primarily about broad acre farming here. You know, corn sorghum fallow, corn or uh, wheat sorghum fallow, wheat corn fallow. Uh, but some of these things will also be very applicable to smaller, you know, uh, onions and, and tomatoes and market gardens and things like that. So, so hold on and see which of these things can help you. One of the most important things for water relations is to generate mulch. And the best plant for generating a whole bunch of mulch in a short period of time is a photoperiod sensitive sorghum sedan grass. That's a lot of mulch right there. That's tons and tons of it. And this is something I use to winter my cattle on. So I turn this mulch into a bunch of stalks and a bunch of manure all mixed together. And the photoperiod sensitive sorghum sedan is the most water efficient. Again, this is tons per inch of water. And the photoperiod sensitive is the most effective out of all those different sorghum varieties. Another one that's very effective at building biomass, this is a legume. This is sun hemp, nine feet tall sun hemp. Um, this is a sandy field that had never successfully raised a corn crop in history. And this was planted double crop after wheat. This is 90 days of growth. 
And that probably contains about 150 pounds of nitrogen. It is not the same as this hemp. You guys are in Colorado, you don't care. This is probably a big difference in Kansas, but not in Colorado. But uh, the sun hemp is not at all related to hemp, or cannabis hemp at all, completely different plant families. Sun hemp is a legume. Sunflower, very drought tolerant. Um, sunflowers are very oily plant and, and lipids, oils, help nourish soil fungi. You probably heard about how important the fungal to bacterial ratio is in the soil. And if you can get it about one to one, um, it really improves your yields, improves your soil aggregation. Sunflowers really help with that. So those are all summer crops. What about spring or fall or winter crops? Um, one of the best is spring peas or winter peas. And uh, spring peas can be planted in spring, they can be planted in fall. Um, if you plant them in the fall, they're, they'll winter kill, but they might get three foot tall before they winter kill. So they can make a lot of nitrogen. Also, um, in addition to their nitrogen fixation, very good at suppressing weeds and uh, very good at providing livestock feed. Now, another, this is faba beans and faba beans are just a nitrogen fixing powerhouse. Very, very uh, productive of nitrogen, has zero forage value. This plant is very, very bitter. Um, I've never seen any animal eat it ever. But it, uh, one other advantage, if you plant this and, um, and allow it and terminate it, the foliage turns black, I mean, dark black. And so if you plant in the fall, let it winter kill, it's sticking up, it's black. And so it warms up very quickly in the spring. So if you want to get an early crop in, potatoes or corn, something like that, uh, having that black color to heat up early can be a big advantage. Flax. Flax is uh, important because it is great for soil microbes and it also has a very, very high lignin persistent residue. Not any good for livestock forage, but this very thin but very tough residue last for years and years. It gives you a long lasting cover. Now, if you wanna plant something in the fall that can make some nitrogen, also suppress weeds like we showed, this hairy vetch is really hard to beat. One of, the, probably the most winter hardy, winter annual legume we have. Now, um, how to fit cover crops into the rotation. Um, this is a center pivot irrigated field. I've also done the same thing with furrow irrigated. Um, went in here and aerially, I have a hard time saying that word. I applied this with an airplane. Um, this was a mixture of seeds that broadcast very well, established from the surface. This is turnips, annual ryegrass, and cereal rye. All three established very well. Rapeseed also establishes very well with an aerial seeding. So that's one option for getting a cover crop growing, uh, in this case, while we still had irrigation. Because um, the uh, on an irrigation district comes down a canal, so we don't have it all the time, like with a well, only available from about July 1st to September 1st. So got it on before the last week of irrigation. This is where they um, planted at the V4 stage of corn. Just when corn's about this tall, they put it in there and uh, about three, four inches tall and drilled that in and then it just kind of sits there while the corn is growing underneath the canopy. And then when they take the corn off, boom, they've got abundant cattle pasture. I've got another picture that I didn't include in here where I've got at harvest some cover crops planted their chest high on me. So a completely abundant. This is another neat thing that some of you vegetable growers might wanna, this is a perennial mulch. This is a perennial cover crop, white clover in between rows. This is strip tilled. This is another organic no-tiller. He's using this white clover as a weed suppressing mulch. And then he also, uh, he strip tills when he plants, has a little knife blade right 
on the front of his planter that's eight inches wide. And then once the corn gets up about a foot tall, he goes in with this machine called a Romo. And each of these little units here has a little blade underneath it, a little spinning blade like a lawnmower. And that not only reduces the competition from that perennial cover, but it chops it up and starts the decay cycle. So all the nitrogen in that clover, or in this case, this is an alfalfa field, it starts to release all the nitrogen that's in it. So it's both his, his weeding and his feeding of the crop. So this is, you see this is field has been uh, till the line between the row mode and not row mode there, but kind of interesting. And if you want to know if this, do these practices actually work? It said, yes, they do over time. Can you see the, the junction between these two fields? This field, same farmer on both sides, but he's been farming this no-till and cover crops for about 15 years. To the left here, this is the first year he's had that farm. So, um, and if you wanna see that there's about a 15 minute movie uh, during the drought, this friend of mine, Michael Thompson, some of you may know him, but uh, check that out on YouTube. And I'll wrap up here real quick here. And uh, this is a book that I wrote on creating a drought resilient farm, about five bushels of wheat or six bushels of corn right now. And it, it does make it rain, in case you were wondering. Um, I had a customer send me that message and I will thank you and Gail, I think you've heard quite a bit of, you know, moisture is definitely a concern mm -hmm. in this area and was wondering kind of some of your thoughts or some studies that have been done that have looked at cover crops and infiltration. Just after hearing the producers um, and their trials, maybe some recommendations that you would have with some of the situations that they've encountered. It's hard to tell where to start here, but cover crops are not a a principle or a practice. And cover crops can be a very valuable tool for, you know, we, we probably all heard the, the five soil health principles, you know, keep the soil covered, don't till, um, diversity, living root at all times, etc. Cover crops are a means of accomplishing several of those. But if you grow cover crops and then violate the principles, you really haven't accomplished your goal. Um, I, I first really started promoting cover crops in, in western Kansas in, uh, in eastern Colorado about 2009, 2010. A few people tried them, had phenomenal results. Their neighbors all saw that success and then tried them in 2011 and 2012. Well, you know what those years were like. People planted, the primary cover crop was monoculture radish. So everybody wanted to break up their hard pan. Well, when you plant that monoculture radish and wheat stubble, and then everybody ran out of pasture because it's two driest years in history, well, maybe until this year, two driest years in history back to back, and everybody was short on feed, so they turned the cattle out in the radishes, pastured it down to bare dirt, and then the next year, 2012, corn failed. They said, well, this cover crop, they don't work around here, we're too dry. Well, I could see people across the fence who planted a diverse cover crop and created mulch and no-tilled into it, had normal yields, normal yields in the driest year in history, right across the line from a completely failed crop because you have to maintain cover. That is so essential. If you grow a cover crop, and then somehow destroy the cover, you've used moisture without creating the mulch. And the mulch is, is paramount. You know, if I can go put a dollar fifty into the stock market and buy game stock or sell game stock or whatever they're doing with game stock, um, and I get three dollars back, that's a good investment. I'll do that a million times and retire. And, and what you do is you play the averages. 
because you're in an area where you have very erratic rainfall. And it's not New Zealand or Ireland where you get a half inch every other day. You get six inches of rain, then it doesn't rain for 18 months. And then you get another six inches of rain, doesn't rain for 18 months. So you play the odds. You look at the monthly averages. What are the odds? How much soil moisture do I have right now? How do I take advantage of that? If you have to follow 10 months in order to raise a grain crop of 20 bushel and your fallow weed control costs are $80 an acre in that time period, why are you raising grain crops? Seriously, why are you raising grain crops? People say, well, cover crops don't work out here because we're too dry. I say, do grain crops work out there? They go, what do you mean? Been growing them for years. I say, are you making money out of them? Well, no. Why do you keep doing it? It's a, and I'm not meaning to be insulting at all. We, we get tunnel vision as that I'm a wheat farmer. I am a corn farmer. No, you should be a sunlight harvester. And if you're going to put $300 an acre into a corn crop that yields less than 100 bushels every year, don't do it. Find something else to do with the land. You know, if you're going to put $200 an acre into a wheat crop that yields 20 bushel, not very often can you get $10 a bushel for wheat or better. I saw some research out of Akron. Um, the guy was trying to prove that cover crops don't work in the area. And uh, he did it in 2011, 2012. And uh, he had cover crops made three tons an acre of forage of, of biomass. And in some situations, some of the treatments. And then he planted wheat in the fall. The spring planted cover crop planted wheat in the fall corn, fallow, wheat rotation, and, uh, and the wheat crop on the average after the cover crops made seven bushel an acre less. And he said, well, obviously you don't want to plant cover crops around here. And uh, everybody's nodding their head. See, I told you cover crops use up all the moisture. He said, but think about it. Think about that. You had three tons of biomass per acre in the year 2012. Hay was selling for $200 a ton. Now, if I give you a choice, say, um, I'll give you, if you give me $300 an acre now, will you give, and I give you $28 an acre next year? Which of us is getting the better deal? Which of us is getting the better deal? Said, in arid environments, I can show you all the growth, the, the curves of water use, and, and everybody knows that uh, that irrigates knows that when grain crops start to flower, when they start to bloom, tassel or, or hit boot stage, the moisture use up goes up dramatically. And in arid environments, the conversion of moisture into biomass and into money is so much more efficient by grazing forage than is raising grain. And I've done the comparison every which way I can. I keep coming up to the same conclusion is that we have really gone down the wrong path, I think, in growing growing grain in the high plain, the drier areas of the high plains. We'd be so much better off growing forage. And I, I hope that grass finished beef really takes off because Colorado is in the driver's seat for raising grass finished beef because you have flatlands next to high elevation and during the hot summer you can just move those animals right up into the high elevation and have a highly nutritious forage and cool conditions and those animals just pack on weight like crazy and uh, talking with other people in the industry, the Jim Garrishes and Joel Salatins, all think that Colorado, the Rocky Mountains and the front range of the Rocky Mountains will be the grass finishing capital of the world at some point in time. And you can make so much more money doing that, even with, without premiums, even using commodity beef products. You can convert an inch of rain into about four times the dollars than you, than you can doing it with grain crops.
I'd have to really go through an hour long presentation to convince you of that, I'm sure, because most people think the exact opposite. The biggest thing is follow those soil health principles. Keep that mulch, mineral disturbance, um, living root, diversity. Don't focus on, I'm a corn farmer, my goal is to raise corn or my goal is to raise wheat or, or whatever crop. Think about in my environment, what is the most effective way to convert sunlight and rainfall into money and, and maintain my soil in the best condition possible? If you could talk about cover crops, using them as a biofumigant. Uh, yes, um, I forget your name. I'm sorry, but you talked about using the mustards and mustards are, are very effective. They uh, contain some compounds called isothiocyanates that are, are very effective soil fumigants. Uh, different mustard varieties will work on different species of pest nematodes. Um, some are effective on northern root knots and some are effective on others. Um, usually, the, to be most successful with those, you either need to, because the compounds are gases when, when they're released. The most effective way is to mow the mustards and then till them under. Of course, that involves tillage. Uh, another way of doing it, if you're on a small scale, is to mow them and then cover with a plastic tarp. So you're holding the gases against the, one of the problems with that is you kill a lot of soil life, but uh, nematodes seem to be very susceptible to that isothiocyanate. Uh, another biofumigating plant is sorghum sedan. Uh, some varieties more so than others. Um, it depends a lot on the, uh, the prussic acid content, which um, prussic acid is a problem if you're potentially a problem if you're grazing livestock on it, uh, but it's a benefit if you're trying to kill nematodes. And um, again, mow it, let it regrow a little bit, mow it again, and then usually incorporate that. Um, I know Sordan 79, Sorghum Sedan is, is kind of the, the variety that people ask for when their uh, next crop is potatoes. Uh, it's very effective against some of the nematodes that affect potatoes. But the sun hemp, the sun hemp is, uh, seems to be really effective, especially against your root knot nematodes, and it does not need incorporated into the ground. So that's really one of my favorite nematicidal plants. Now, all those plants I mentioned have some nematicidal activity, even if they're not incorporated. I, I'm, you know, I don't like tillage. I think tillage causes a lot of soil destruction. Um, I think you're so much better off if you can find ways to avoid and eliminate tillage. Big fan of the sun hemp. And we're, we're finding more and more all the time that have, have some beneficial effects on that. There are some nematode control radishes uh, that are, are somewhat effective. And of course have, you know, the big tap root for alleviating compaction as well. So. And nice thing about the radishes, they don't need incorporated either because so much of that root is underground. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I had a very high phosphorus content. was wondering if you had any suggestions. What problems is the high phosphorus causing? Is it uh, like an environmental issue? Uh, with well, that thing, I don't know if it's causing a problem because on all other scales, it's really green and it's really high, but I have the highest phosphorus. Um, it can interfere with zinc uptake. It's, it's not a problem in and of itself. It's the only problem that you could maybe have, you have a real strong manure history. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We run uh, uh, chickens. What they typically, places with a very strong manure history, it's really common around dairies. And once you get over about a hundred parts per million, they start telling you that you need to draw that down just for environmental purposes, because the, the runoff water tends to be really high uh, in phosphorus and that can cause issues once it gets in, in the water systems and you get algal blooms and fish kills and things like that. Um, what they tell the dairies is start 
you got to stop applying manure to those acres and you need to start harvesting hay and moving some of those nutrients off the field. And when you're in a livestock enterprise, that's rather, rather hard to do because you're on the opposite end of that spectrum. But uh, I, I look at that as an opportunity myself. I mean, you've, you've got an abundant supply of a nutrient and someday there's, it's a nutrient that there are very finite resources around the world. There's only a few, a few places where they can mine phosphate at some point in time, you will probably look at that as a blessing because I think that the next world war will be fought over phosphorus, not oil, not even water, phosphorus, because it is in such limited. So it, it's, it's abundant now, but yeah. there's only about five places in the world, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, it's a place in the Soviet Union, and you know, about two places. Florida and then in the Rocky Mountains is really the, the major phosphate mines in the world. And of those, except for the two areas we have in the U.S., they're all in places that are with host governments that are hostile to us. And so it is a concern. You know, the figure we've got about at the current use rate, we've got 50 to 80 years of phosphorus we might not see the end of we we've definitely hit peak phosphorus around the world grain is rich in phosphorus and then when that cycles through the chickens that's where it's ending up it's a great it's a great way of building fertility i mean you you've essentially got too much of a good thing so if, if you're able to i'd just move the chickens to a new location and maybe use the pasture that you've got if you want to rotate, grow grain crops there to feed the chickens in the new location. That's easier than moving dirt. They can move the phosphorus without having to move the dirt, so. I guess I had a question for you when in August, you guys had your field day in Nebraska. Is that something that you guys do annually? Yes, we do. Uh, usually every August. Uh, people get get on our website. We've, we've got our, our YouTube channel. We've got, I don't know, 250, 300 videos on there. Everything from little two minute clips about this plan or that plan to, you know, hour and a half long presentations by internationally known scientists like Christine Jones or um, Chris Nichols or, um, you know, Rick Haney, those kind of people. Um, that are way smarter than me. Um, and we've got a bunch of written information on there. Uh, just get on there. It's, it's all free. So just get what you can. Um, we can send you, you can either download one of these soil health resource guides um, or we can mail you one. Again, they're free. Um, the only thing you get charged for is if you buy one of my books. Um, but uh, contact me directly if you're interested in one of those. But yeah, the field day, again, free deal. Uh, we are having a conference March 5th and 6th at our new Iola warehouse. And that's in Southeast Kansas. It's about straight south of Topeka. The neat thing about this conference is we have an indoor greenhouse growth chamber inside our warehouse. We will have all of our cover crops growing in that growth chamber. So even when it's snowy and cold and in Colorado on March 5th and 6th, you can come and take a cover crop plot tour and shorts and t-shirts if you want to. If you're interested, just get on our website and, and find out what you can. Great. Thank you. And, and I, I would definitely recommend people checking out your guys' videos. You guys have done a great series on those. So super informative, great speakers.